Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Fernando Florido and I'm a GP in the United Kingdom. In today's episode, I look at a new random diabetic case to see how the guidelines could be applied to it. By word disclaimer, I'm not giving medical advice. See the description for full information. And as you know, we're only focusing on the pharmacological treatment. Remember that there's also a podcast version of these videos, so have a look in the description below. So let's spin the wheel to generate our random patient. If you want to miss this, just go to the next track on this video. Right? We have a 45-year-old woman with an HbA1c of 60 or 7.6%, with an EGFR of 45. Now other medical history, she's at high risk of cardiovascular disease. Now the number of diabetic drugs, three. Because it is three, we will assume that one of them is metformin, 500 milligrams BD. We found out if she's on insulin and the answer is no. Now we spin twice for the other oral anti-diabetic agents and she is on a, an SGLT2 inhibitor and the DDP4 inhibitor. Right, so now she is on saxagliptin 2.5 mg daily as the DPP4 inhibitor and apoclifloxin 10 mg daily as the SGLT2 inhibitor and the BMI which is 43. Right, so very obese. Okay, so we have a 45 year old woman with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes with an HbA1c of 60 millimoles per mole or 7.6% who has CKD stage 3a with an EGFR of 45 and who is also at high risk of cardiovascular disease. She is also on triple therapy with metformin 500 milligrams twice a day, dapagliflozin 10 milligrams daily and saxagliptin 2.5 milligrams daily. And finally, she is severely obese with a BMI of 43. So let's have a look at the guidelines. As usual, I will focus on the NICE guidelines, but at the end, I will tell you what my interpretation would have been following the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, American Diabetes Association consensus guideline. Firstly, NICE says that we need to consider if rescue therapy is necessary for symptomatic hyperglycemia, with insulin or sulfonylurea. And for the clinical presentation, we will say that she has no symptoms of diabetes, her obesity is long-standing and being managed with diet, lifestyle advice and a bariatric referral. We have excluded other causes of obesity, for example hypothyroidism or Cushing's disease, and because of her age, other causes of CKD such as glomerulonephritis or obstructive nephropathy have also been excluded and she has a diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy. Right, so what are my thoughts? Firstly, that she is relatively young and she already has a degree of diabetic nephropathy. So we should manage her fairly aggressively to try and improve her diabetic control and improve long-term outcomes. Secondly, it seems quite clear that her main problem is her weight. She is severely obese and already being managed for that. I'm very pleased to see that she's not on any medication that promotes weight gain. Both metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors promote weight loss and DPP4 inhibitors are weight neutral. So Dr. Spinning Wheel has done very well indeed. The first step is always metformin, which would be helpful for her weight too. So I would be interested to see why she's only on 500 milligrams twice a day instead of the full dose, double that, 1000 milligrams twice a day. I would first look to see if it has been kept at that dose because of safety reasons, for example, because of a renal function. You can prescribe metformin 1000 milligrams twice a day to anyone with an EGFR of 45 or above. Her EGFR is exactly that, 45. Because of being right on the limit, I would want to be sure and I would look back and see what her previous renal function tests have been. If previously the EGFR has been bumping along the high 40s or 50s, I would definitely increase the dose because the drop to 45 could be just a temporary bleep, so to speak. Although, of course, we would watch her renal function closely. If, on the other hand, her previous EGFR readings have been in the high 30s or low 40s, then I would not increase the dose because I would want to see a stable EGFR 45 or above before increasing the dose. 
If she's suitable for a dose increase, I would also like to look at previous records and see if she has not tolerated higher doses before. And if that is the case, I would also want to make sure that she has been managed appropriately. Knife says that metformin should be increased gradually over several weeks to minimize the risk of gastrointestinal side effects. So if the previous increasing dose was abrupt, I would want to revisit it. Also, I would make sure that the patient is counseled and advised that for many patients, the side effects are temporary and get better over a number of weeks. So I would advise that if the side effects are not severe, to try and work through them to see if the short-term inconvenience of the side effects can translate into a long-term therapeutic benefit. And finally, if she has not been able to tolerate it, despite these efforts, NICE says that we should consider a trial of modified release metformin. So I would offer this to her too. So I am really emphasizing that we should leave no stone unturned before giving up on the benefits of a full dose of metformin, especially in a person with such an obesity problem. So let, let's assume that she's keen and able to increase the dose of metformin. So we do that. Would I try to add or increase any other medication in this consultation too? Because I want to manage her aggressively and all her medication has a very low risk of hypoglycemia, I would say yes. True, we may advise her to delay the addition or the increase of other drugs for a few days or weeks to make sure that if side effects develop, we know which medication is the culprit. But as soon as the patient is sure that the increased dose of metformin is not causing any issues, I would add or increase the other medication. I would not want to leave her for, say, three months before further action is taken. So as the next step, NICE says that for patients at high risk of cardiovascular disease, we need to consider an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit. And she is on the full dose of tapagliflozin, which is one of them. The cardiovascular benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors is a drug class effect, so there isn't necessarily any need to consider other types if there's no concern with the use of tapagliflozin. Tapagliflozin can be initiated as long as the EGFR is above 15, so her EGFR of 45 is not a problem. So we now look at the third drug, which is a DPP4 inhibitor, saxagliptin 2.5 mg daily. NICE says that for patients who are not controlled with dual therapy with metformin and an SGLT2 inhibitor, we should consider either triple therapy, including combinations with either a sulfonylurea or a DPP4 inhibitor, or going directly from dual therapy to starting insulin. I'm definitely going to exclude insulin and a sulfonylurea at this stage because they can be associated with weight gain, which is the last thing that this patient needs. As we have seen, DPP4 inhibitors are acceptable and saxagliptin is already prescribed. NICE says that the recommended dose of saxagliptin is 5 mg daily and the patient is only on 2.5 mg daily. However, the dose of saxagliptin has to be reduced to 2.5 mg daily if the EGFR is below 45. So we're in the same situation as with metformin earlier. If the EGFR has been consistently been about 45, you can increase the dose, but not otherwise. There are many other considerations when choosing which DPP4 inhibitor you're going to use, and they all have different thresholds for renal impairment and also for other conditions like hepatic impairment, heart failure, and for the elderly. So I would encourage you to look at your formulary carefully before making the decision. I will put in the episode description the link for the NICE guidance on DPP4 inhibitor prescribing in case that you're interested. It is worth saying that linagliptin is the only DPP4 inhibitor that does not require dose adjustment for renal or hepatic impairment. So if there's any doubt, you can always give linagliptin at the full recommended dose of 5 mg daily. So this is my interpretation for this patient following the NICE guidelines. Number one, increase metformin if at all possible. Number two, continue dapagliflozin at the full dose. And number three, increase the dose of saxagliptin to 5 mg daily if renal function allows, or switch it to linagliptin 5 mg daily if there are any concerns. 
What would I do if I were following the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and American Diabetes Association consensus guideline? Well, I would still try to increase metformin if at all possible, and then, because this patient has a high cardiovascular risk, she would be started on a GLP-1 receptor agonist for their cardiovascular benefit, independently of the HbA1c level. This would also have the added benefit of their weight loss, so that would be a great thing for this patient too. The difference is that NICE is more restrictive when it comes to GLP-1 receptor agonists, and they would only be considered if the initial suggestion that I said earlier failed to control the patient. You can prescribe all the GLP-1 receptor agonists as long as the EGFR is above 30, so not a real issue for this patient. I will put in the episode description a link to the guidance for the prescribing of GLP-1 receptor agonists, so have a look if you're interested. Acceptable options would be the exenatide, liraglutide, lixisenatide, dulaglutide or semaglutide. The next step after metformin and a GLP-1 receptor agonist, according to the European and American consensus guidelines, is an SGLT2 inhibitor. So my interpretation for this patient, following the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and American Diabetes Association guideline, is 1. Increase metformin if at all possible. 2. Stop saxagliptin and start a GLP-1 receptor agonist and three, continued apaglifosin at the full dose. But remember, these are only my interpretations, so they may not be the only ones, or indeed, the best ones. Please let me know your views in the comment section below. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful, and if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.